Hi, I'm Nick Sider. I'm a field crop entomologist with the University of Illinois. And in this session, I'll be focusing on above ground Bt traits in corn and some of the insect pests that we manage with these tools. Now, Bt traits in general and control with Bt traits in general, it can be a complicated topic even more complicated with the above ground traits than it is with the below ground traits because we have multiple targets. And when we look at these multiple insect targets, and these are the three that are going to be the most important in Illinois. They're certainly not the only three targets of the above ground traits, but they're the three that we're most concerned with in Illinois. Each one of these three insect pests has a little different situation when it comes to BT traits and when it comes to not just effectively controlling these insects with BT traits, but effectively managing resistance to those three traits. You'll find that in all three cases, the situation is just a little bit different here. And so we want to take each of these individually. Now, the first insect pest that we need to consider when we think about the above ground BT trait packages is the European corn borer. This was actually the initial target uh, of the first BT traits that were released back in the mid 90s. And this is an insect that once upon a time was the most damaging pest of corn in Illinois. And in fact, throughout most of the corn belt. And while they'll feed directly on the ears, as you can see a little bit in this picture here, the primary damage from European corn borer is, <laughs> sorry about that, is damage to the stock, especially from the second generation of this insect. So European corn borer is actually going to go through two generations per year. Uh, the first generation is going to feed primarily within the whorls, and it's going to take really a lot of that kind of damage uh, to cause us any appreciable yield loss. However, the second generation, which is going to be feeding within the stocks uh, during and after the reproductive stages, can lead to a variety of issues, including stock and ear lodging. In addition to boring through the stock, they'll bore into the shank of that ear and cause ears to fall off. They'll cause stocks to fall over. They'll cause reduced water and, and nutrient translocation through that plant. And for good measure, this feeding also is a route for pathogens to, to infest that plant. It's really some pretty severe damage that we can see from this insect if it's left uncontrolled. Another thing to note about the European corn borer, insecticidal control and especially timing that control is quite difficult to do effectively with this insect. And so with the above ground traits for European corn borer, we have not just an effective tool, um, but one that is a lot easier to use than insecticides. Now, in addition to the European corn borer, we have several ear feeding pests that can also be managed with above ground BT traits and two of them in particular that we'll discuss in this talk. First of these is going to be the corn earworm, aptly named as you can see here. This picture is actually from sweet corn where this is really the key pest in, in Illinois in, in sweet corn. Less of an issue in field corn but we do see infestation fairly commonly. In fact, this is going to be the most common ear feeding pest that we see in Illinois. One thing that is unique about the corn earworm, this is a migratory insect in Illinois. So we're getting our corn earworms primarily from the southern United States where they've already gone through a generation. They'll go through several generations per year. And so we get those late arriving moths typically beginning in July on into July that have already gone through a generation typically in corn, although they have many hosts down south. 
And so we tend to get these a little bit later in the season. And for that reason, the later that we plant corn, the more of an issue we tend to have with corn earworm. And if you recall in 2019, we saw a lot of issues with corn earworm. We saw more infestation with corn earworm maybe than we're used to seeing. And as you recall in 2019, we had a terrible planting season and a lot of our fields were planted quite late. And so that had a lot to do with that increase in pressure. Now the good news about corn earworm this damage isn't as bad as it looks in field corn when we talk about yield loss. Uh, the plant's able to compensate for this feeding at the tip very well. Certainly corn earworm tends to concentrate most of its feeding at the tips of the ears. When it comes down to it, we don't see much in the way of direct yield loss from this insect. What we do see, as you might imagine, is a reduction in quality. And this feeding is an entry site for ear rot pathogens, including those ear rot pathogens that can cause mycotoxin issues. That's really where we see, if we're going to see problems from corn earworm feeding, it, it's more on that side. It's more issues with quality and mycotoxins not necessarily yield loss uh, with, with the corn earworm in the Midwestern United States. Now, we do have another ear feeding pest that can be a serious issue, although in a much more limited geographical area in Illinois, and that's the western bean cutworm. So this is an insect that really started to emerge as a pest of corn maybe about 15 years ago, 12 to 15 years ago in the Midwestern United States. It's been an issue out in western Nebraska for some time. It's an issue in dry bean production, as the name would suggest. Where we really see issues with western bean cutworm is in areas with sandy soil. And in Illinois, typically we're talking about up here in, in Kankakee and Will County, in that sand blow uh, just south of Lake Michigan there. Of course, if you were to expand that map out regionally, you'll see that the primary issues with western bean cutworm in the Midwestern US right now, they follow that, that sandier soil into northern Indiana and on into Michigan and even up into Ontario. That's where we've seen issues with western bean cutworm. Now, there's a few differences uh, between western bean cutworm and corn earworm that are pretty important for management. One, western bean cutworm is not as cannibalistic as the corn earworm, and so you do have more instances of multiple larvae per ear. Another big difference with the western bean cutworm, it's a little more likely than corn earworm is to feed on the sides of the ear and around the ear in addition to just limiting its feeding to the tip. For that reason, it appears to do a little more direct yield loss than the corn earworm does. And this region where it's a pest also happens to overlap in many cases with regions where mycotoxins are more of an issue. So again, uh, the potential for quality loss and ear rots and mycotoxins is there with this particular insect pest. So that's sort of the cast of characters as we deal with it in Illinois. Of course, there's other targets of the above ground BT traits. Fall armyworm, for instance, southwestern corn borer. Uh, but we're really going to focus on these three because they're the ones that should drive our decision making throughout most of Illinois. And I'll point out with southwestern corn borer, that insect in terms of its biology and in terms of resistance management with BT traits, it's actually quite similar to European corn borer in that regard. So just keep that in mind if you're in part of the state where you deal with the southwestern corn borer a little more frequently. So when we look at the individual BT proteins that are available to us above ground in corn. This is sort of the, the list that we have available to us. Cry1AB, VIP3A, Cry1F, 
and then cry 1a.105 and cry 2ab2, which are always going to be present together as a pyramid. So this is kind of the cast of characters when we talk about the proteins that are available to us. Looks pretty simple um, in this chart. Uh, these aren't the only combinations that are available to us. And in fact, there's a large number of different above ground trait combinations out there. And this can be fairly difficult to keep straight for, for many of us, myself included. Now one thing to point out when you look at this chart, not all of these trait packages are widely available to us right now, so keep that in mind. There's a much smaller number of these that we're really actively using. But you can see that these different traits are, are present in a variety of combinations. And it, if you want a good resource to help keep these different proteins in these different trait packages straight is this handy BT trait table. I'll provide this link again at the end of the talk. Really encourage you to use this and reference this when you're making those hybrid decisions and when you're trying to determine what particular above ground BT proteins are present in, in the trait packages that you're purchasing. Now when we look at those three different insects, the situation in terms of management with these BT traits is actually quite different among those three different insects. With the first one, again, the European corn borer, which was the primary target of these when it was originally introduced, these traits have been almost an unmitigated success in terms of control of this insect. It's really been quite remarkable to the point, as you can see in this article here, that we've actually suppressed the population of this insect over a wide area through the use of these traits. They remain very effective today and in fact growers of non-BT corn and organic corn reap some of the benefits of this suppression because European corn borer has become less of a pest in those systems as well. Uh, really quite remarkable, and what's really remarkable is that, you know, 25 years after these traits were released, give or take, we really haven't had meaningful field evolved resistance. We haven't had any in the United States. We, we've had an isolated incident that we're continuing to watch with one of these proteins, Cry1F, up in Nova Scotia. But we haven't seen any loss of efficacy so far with these materials in the U.S. And we know that won't last forever. It never will. Uh, but so far we've been pretty fortunate with these proteins for control of the European corn borer. There's a number of reasons for that with the biology. The primary one being that this is a true high-dose toxin. Uh, very, very, very few individuals survive exposure to these toxins with the European corn borer. And so when we look at the toxins that are available, uh, of course the, the VIP protein here is not effective against European corn borer. It's in fact, it's not designed to be effective against European corn borer. Um, these other four proteins are effective and in the United States remain highly effective against European corn borer. So we really, we still have a, a pretty large toolbox in the scheme of things for control of this insect. Again, there's a variety of reasons why these have been so effective for control of this insect. The high dose, the, the, the refuge strategy with these traits was really designed after the biology of European corn borer in many ways. And so these remain a very effective tool for control of this insect. Now, of course, as you might imagine, it, we, we haven't had this unmitigated success story to the same extent with some of these other insect pests, and they are where things get a little bit more complicated. The situation with the corn earworm in particular is quite complicated. One thing to point out with this insect, because it's not overwintering successfully, 
in Illinois, a lot of the resistance issues that we see are actually coming from the southern United States. And in the southern United States, they face, one, much higher pressure from this insect. The populations of corn earworm are much higher in the southern U.S. Two, they're actively managing this insect in cotton. In fact, they're much more concerned with corn earworm control in cotton, where they have many of the same BT traits available to them, than they are in corn. But when we look at above ground BT control of the corn earworm, all five of these traits have at least some activity on this insect, or at least they did initially. Now I have the VIP protein underlined there. That VIP protein is the only one that achieves close to a, a true high dose against this insect. There was a fair amount of survivorship against all of these on day one when these proteins were released. And, and that's something that's important to keep in mind when we look at how much more quickly resistance has developed in the corn earworm than it did in the European corn borer. So now when we look at the situation today, we have resistance to four of these five proteins relatively commonly. Um, resistance to all of these is fairly widespread. Now, it's not full resistance to any of them. Um, what we see with this insect is a gradual loss of susceptibility over time. And so with all of these proteins that have been somewhat compromised, you're still going to see a reduction in damage and a reduction in populations compared with a non-BT, at least in, in Illinois. But we're losing these fairly quickly. And the VIP protein is the only one that we haven't seen relatively widespread resistance developed to yet. And of course, in, in Texas and elsewhere, there's some early indications that we might be seeing some resistance to the BT protein, or to the VIP protein. Haven't seen that yet in Illinois. But that's the situation with this insect, uh, much less encouraging when we look at corn earworm than it is with the, with the European corn borer. We were actually conducting a, a number of, well, a, a national network of sentinel trials to look at resistance development in this insect. And these are the results from Illinois this last year. This is the first time we conducted this work in Illinois. You'll see here. Uh, you'll see here we had no damage and no survivorship at all on the VIP protein. Other thing you'll note here: we actually conducted this work in sweet corn, which, for a variety of biological reasons, is a better choice for sentinel monitoring of resistance issues out there. Uh, these proteins are the same proteins that are used in field corn. But as you can see at our site in Illinois, we're seeing quite a bit of damage on both Cry1AB and this Cry1A105 plus Cry2AB2 combination. And we're seeing quite a few larvae per ear as well, uh, comparable as far as the number of larvae we're seeing to the non-BT. They are developing more slowly. We are, as you can see here, still dramatically reducing the level of damage that we see in these BT traits compared with the, the non-BT control. But we do see a fair amount of resistance uh, to these trait packages other than the VIP3A trait package with this insect. And we expect to see more of this in the future. Now keep in mind, we're inheriting these individuals from the southern United States where a lot of the selection is occurring and where that resistance is fairly widespread. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone when we see some damage on these trait packages. That's just the nature of this insect. Uh, what's really concerning about that is even, you know, with the VIP protein where we have no resistance currently, and we don't have a lot of adoption of that particular protein in Illinois uh, just yet. That adoption is certainly increasing. That selection is going on down south, and if so if they start to lose that protein, ultimately we will start to lose that protein too, because with this insect, 
we're getting those populations from the southern United States. Now finally we have the situation with the western bean cutworm which is altogether different from these other two and you know as you might imagine we saved the best for last it's not different in a good way. So when we look at these BT traits for western bean cutworm control there are only two of them that were initially effective um, and that's the VIP protein and then Cry1F. Of course, if you remember how these traits were introduced, they were not introduced at the same time. VIP has not been around nearly as long as these other proteins. And by the time VIP came around, we already had a pretty high degree of resistance to Cry1F out there. And so when we look at BT traits for Western bean cutworm control, that VIP protein is really the only effective one that we have currently in the current system. Given the situation, primarily with the corn earworm, but with western bean cutworm as well, the EPA is currently looking at changing the way that they attempt to manage resistance to these insects. And in particular, they're some, proposing some changes to try and help preserve some efficacy to the corn earworm. Uh, that one is really at the top of their list because of the damage that can do, especially to cotton in the south. Uh, but western bean cutworm is a large part of this as well. And they're proposing a number of changes. Some of these may seem a little bit innocuous to uh, growers and, and consultants, or maybe innocuous isn't the word perhaps something that'll be in the background to y'all. Uh, but one of that, one of those changes are new definitions of resistance, relying more on practical observations of resistance out in the field rather than laboratory bioassays that with these insects can be a little bit misleading and can also be a little bit difficult to conduct with these particular insects. You'd, you'd be amazed how difficult it is to keep corn earworms alive in the laboratory. Uh, they're also looking at changes to resistance monitoring, including more of a focus on using sentinel plots for monitoring out in the field, uh, similar to the experiment that I showed you earlier. Uh, they also have some changes that we, they'll be making, some procedural changes to the reporting of unexpected damage events out in the field, trying to communicate that information more rapidly and to more stakeholders. Uh, hopefully these uh, changes will help to better identify resistance issues as they develop so that the proper steps can be taken to mitigate those uses. They also have some additional proposed changes, or actually they've sort of proposed to propose uh, these changes. They released some additional measures for public comment several months ago that could ultimately be put into place. And, you know, one thing I'll note, I'm recording this talk in December, uh, so there is a chance that they may have acted on this by the time these recordings are released, although I don't know that that'll be the case, but there is a chance that that could happen. One of these proposals, and probably the most controversial of these, would be a phase down of single traits, and maybe more controversially, a, a phase down of non-functional pyramided trait packages. Now, the phase down of single trait products is really already begun, and it's becoming more and more difficult every year to obtain a, a product that has a single trait for above ground caterpillar management. That I don't know if any of you all have those available to you or not. Certainly from a resistance management standpoint, what we've found with other insects and with the European corn borer up in Canada, when those single traits are released by themselves, that tends to be a bad news for resistance development. So the, the trait packages that are available to us from now on are very likely going to have a pyramid. Now the non-functional pyramids puts us into a bit of a pickle. You'll recall with 
corn earworm, VIP is the only protein that isn't partially compromised by resistance right now. There's still a lot of susceptibility out there with those other proteins. There's still a lot of value with those. Um, but depending on how this is defined, this could mean that only corn that has the VIP trait in it would be released. When you consider the western bean cutworm, of course, VIP is the only effective protein for that insect. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do here. Uh, I would be pretty concerned if we end up in a situation where every acre of BT corn in Illinois has that VIP protein in it. I don't think that would be a good situation in terms of resistance management for those insect pests. Uh, we'll see what ultimately happens with that, but that is one of the potential changes that has been proposed, and certainly the phase down of single traits is going to happen, and that ultimately will be something that helps us in terms of resistance management. There's also been some discussion of increasing the percent refuge seed in seed blends to 10%. Seed blends are also a little bit of a sticking point when we look at these resistance management measures. Uh, seed blends aren't terribly effective with some of these insects as far as a resistance management tool. The ear feeding pests in particular, there's a lot of concern with these. so be interesting to see what happens um, with them. There's some benefits to seed blend, in particular the fact that we don't have to think about planting a separate refuge at that point. There's no chance for non-compliance at that point. But in terms of the biology, especially of these above ground pests and especially of those that feed on ears, there are some concerns with that blended refuge approach. Um, Finally, there, there's talk of some, maybe some increased or at least more enforcement of the penalties that are out there for non-compliance with a structured refuge in those areas where a structured refuge is required, which under their proposal would be primarily be the southern United States. But at any rate, there, there is some talk of putting some teeth on these measures to prevent people from purchasing uh, BT seed if they do not comply with the, the refuge uh, requirements. So those are something to, to keep an eye out on, for in the future. If you're interested, there was a public comment period about these traits and uh, many of my colleagues and I uh, put together a public comment with our thoughts on what the, the refuge requirements should be. That's available through the EPA's website. If you're interested in reading a bunch about uh, the biology of these insects and the resistance management implications of that, feel free to check that out. Uh, maybe, maybe pretty dry reading for most of you on that case. So in terms of what we should do now, what should we be thinking about with our management of these insects, there's a few important things to keep in mind. Number one, while we have some major issues in terms of resistance management with corn earworm and western bean cutworm in particular, keep in mind we're getting a lot of benefit from this technology right now in terms of European corn borer. So European corn borer has gone from an insect that really drove our pest management system in many ways back in the mid-90s to an insect pest that we don't really deal with in Illinois on very many acres in any given year. Uh, that's something we'd like to continue. Certainly I don't want to have to start dealing with European corn borer on a regular basis. It's a challenging pest to, to manage and the costs for getting that management wrong are severe. So we do want to look at making sure that we're practicing proper pest management, proper use of these tools to preserve its efficacy against that insect in particular. In terms of the other two, you know, if you're dealing with corn earworm, I, I do want to reinforce and to remind you that the actual yield reduction from that insect is minimal. It's the issues with quality and the issues with potential mycotoxin development that we need to be concerned with. 
So if you don't have a history of those sorts of issues associated with corn earworm, it's not an insect that you have to worry about too terribly much in Illinois. In the southern U.S. where I used to work, we just got used to seeing that ugly damage in every field every year, and we understood that we weren't losing much in terms of yield from corn earworm. And I would encourage you to do the same. Obviously, it's a different situation if you're growing sweet corn. It's a nightmare pest in that situation. Obviously, it's a different situation if you're growing seed corn. Keep in mind that the options for dealing with corn earworm chemically are pretty limited. It's going to take multiple applications. The way we deal with that problem in sweet corn typically is repeated sprays throughout silking. We can't afford to do that in field corn. Uh, so just keep that in mind with the corn earworm in particular. Also keep in mind with western bean cutworm, it's a relatively limited geography where we're dealing with that insect in Illinois right now. Most of the issues historically have been concentrated up in Will County and, and Kankakee County in that, in that region where you have those sandier soils. If you're not in that situation where you haven't been dealing with western bean cutworm in the past, very likely you're not going to be dealing with it in the future because of its close relationship with that soil type. If you are doing it and you're currently relying totally on that VIT protein for control, I would encourage you to consider devoting some acres to non-BT and trying to manage that through scouting and a well-timed insecticide where it's needed on some of those acres. I'm not going to say do that on, on all of your acres, you know, if you've got a 10,000 acre field, but try to mix up that management a little bit. What we really want to avoid in all these systems, and ultimately, what we're trying to avoid with the case of any resistance development is over-reliance on any one tool. When we put one tool out on all of our acres in any situation, we know what we get with that. We get resistance from that. That's the situation that we're trying to avoid. And so I would encourage you wherever you can to diversify your management operations for these insect pests. Uh, to help to mitigate some of these resistance issues that we're seeing. With that, uh, we'll point out the following uh, resources. In particular, that handy BT trait table is great for identifying what you're working with in terms of the, the BT proteins in these different trait packages and what insects they're targeting. Um, with that, Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions, and thank you for your time, and thank you for participating in this session.